first in our line of features for this morning, we have Candace Curran. Candace grew up in Princeton near Mount Wachusett. Farm settlers were her ancestors. Her father was a mechanic and she played in old car wrecks and liked to play in the woods and pretend she was looking for dinosaurs. She said that her background's a patchwork quilt over time. She feels that her respect for the land and for poetry um, is combined in her work and she likes to see poetry also lifted from the page and installed uh, artfully in unexpected areas such as a labor bill or on a, on a barn as I had mentioned or the hood of a car. She's a founder of Interface Collaboration of Visual Art and Poetry uh, since 1992 in the Quabbin area. She frequently teaches workshops. She's been honored at, as Massachusetts Poet Seat Laureate and she has a number of books and uh, some of them here, I believe. And um, she gave me this great quote I'd like to call her up uh, with. Maybe writing down crazy thoughts and feelings in difficult times, journaling for sanity was my initiation to poetry. I was stuck in my head with childhood depression and began by writing three lines and then four and a page and then a book. I've always been inward and backwards, but somehow poetry realized and justified events and feelings, corralling monsters. I was happy when the I became universally realized, relaying the ah, the O oh of a collective consciousness, a collective consciousness. There are many people without voices. For instance, once someone had read a couple of my poems published in Mosaic Magazine and commented that they freed her using words imprisoned in her own mind. She wrote it in simple and brave words that wrenched. And so uh, that's quite a quote, and I thank her for it and look forward to her poetry now. Please welcome up warmly, Candace Curran. My book, Playing in Rex, is separated by four chapters, and they're haiku postcards. Haiku postcard chapter two. Mooncalf laughs at a mud puppy in the dog's dish, swimming in circles. Mooncalf laughs at a mud puppy in the dog's dish, swimming in circles. The first poem is Playing in Rex from the title. A tow truck brings in the wrecks, strung up by the neck like shiny fish, no fight left in them, and lays them to rest behind Hubbard's garage. When everything is still life, the family leaving the thing for dead, I approach respectfully, enter and log a sketchy stretch of playhouse miles. This is where I learn to stop, look, listen. Do you believe in ghosts? Steer, shift, and look both ways for flashbacks and stains and broken glass. This is where I whisper out loud a reverent prayer and question, am I a crazy child? And understanding the laws of just in case and you better believe it, kiss the dashboard, cross my congregational chest, and guide each soul out of the metal after me. The flying dream again. Some nights, bright as day, I am flying in the old Princeton Center schoolyard, my belief in it keeping me up each soar, a pole vault of hope drifting, gently lifting me over wires and swing sets, trees and the jungle gym, each swoop bringing me closer to the knee scab ground, and Alan, Bobby, Carly laughing, screaming, running beneath me, all holding me in their eyes, wishing me up as if I am their tethered dream. Haiku Postcard, Chapter 3. New England still life, best in show, disappearing from matinee seats. New England still life, best in show, disappearing from matinee seats. I live near the Quabbin in Western Mass, and uh, it's a great place. 
Long ago, farmers planted varieties of New England field stone like potatoes in long, neat rows. Every now and then I come across them naturalized, some growing in clumps, while others wander aimlessly, distracted, without purpose or direction, leading us astray, perhaps, this way, that way, looking like Grandpa's tumble-down teeth, losing hold, or the monuments of kin, leaning, pointing, footing lost somewhere under the fertile deep. A beautiful and then scary moment in a Northfield cornfield and bird sanctuary. And this is a true story. On and off cornstalks light switch, fawn and raspberry in the warm zen-like rain and shine. And I'm full of walk therapy hope and meditation that the nearby nuclear plant isn't leaking, spawning, spreading bread and butter death, but I don't know. And then lose it when the test siren sticks and firecracker trees tremble on the Connecticut. Shimmy, shimmy, shake, nipmunk from the muddy bank and kingfisher shooting loose staking heart with his runaway arrow. Haiku Postcard, Chapter One. Histrionics orchestrate thunderstorms from yard sale director's chairs. Histrionics orchestrate thunderstorms from yard sale director chairs. And the poem is called Jigsaw. And I did that with um, the artist Dick Baldwin did, that did the cover for the book, Playing in Rex. It's a great, very tiny painting, but very big idea that I couldn't forget. And um, we did a word and image event together and I was thinking about this chair in particular. Jigsaw. I'm beginning to wonder what you didn't take. What you didn't fake. I know you left a whiskey burn and false impressions in an easy chair. You are a malingerer in, in empty... Oh, sorry about that. You are a malingerer in crazy jigsaw spaces in empty bullet places. You left a dangerous taste in a mouth heart burned. I like it when people go, mmm, <laughs> oh, 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 that's nice. Um, tumbling, and this is a rant. Down again I take you down among jagged rock walking sticks, last year's ragged blackened reeds to the quiet pooling, the runaway suds and beer in your ear roar the brown waters of Bear's Den, where your reflection renewing, resurfacing, shoves heart to her side, she's just trying to keep her head up, but all jealous and green, jealousy green the color of moss and pine monster, dragonflies sewing up eyes, ears, loose ends to no end, and I'm fit to be tied, swallowed, and sunk, dwelling on your love for another, any other, every other, man, woman, beast you smile for with your patty green, outdweller serpentine, turpentine eyes. If you were a season, just a season, a rough winter to survive, I would drain you, have you packed and stacked away like kindling. Bled and oiled the rusty springs, but haven't I tried everything, and you're still a man that's leaving. Haiku Postcard, Chapter 4 Ghost riding shotgun, ricochets off the rear view. Deja vu season. Ghost riding shotgun, ricochets off the rear view. Deja vu season. I'm really into automotive poetry. I don't know if you can tell that. <laughs> 
and the poem is called Downshift. I bring my attention back to the road, the drive, the mechanics of steel, and away from your ghost-riding shotgun, your face remembered into the rear view. Where did you climb on? Memory clicks in and out on the radio dial. Chambers fill with trick lyric until I'm off on a tangent, the break down a ditch somewhere going nowhere with you. I bring myself back, the ride, the road, the feel of the wheel waylaid plans for a getaway. At the base of my neck, your touch slow at the curve drops like a serpent. I drive a thin ribbon of road, soft bones and velvet throat, where sun distills butter rum and you don't follow. Where I crash dummy into oncoming darkness, knocking like a lover at her yawn and swallow. And the last poem. It's all going so fast. <laughs> Nobody's saying, time, time, time. <laughs> the poem is called Morning Stokes the Stove. Morning Stokes the Stove. And Hope lifts his head from the kitchen table like he heard his name being called. He staggers from shadow and shade to see light stuttering without obedience or control, sparking the hard dark. This is what we want for ourselves. In a stand of trees, we are crows brought to something shiny, and suddenly, the sun. Thank you all. Highway humming under me, the soothing sound of make-believe Taking me to anywhere but where I'm meant to be Setting sun off in the west, and me I'm hoping for the best Still wondering, wondering where I'm meant to be Nowhere to go Wind place will show me now Nowhere to go Wondering where I'm meant to be The radio soft and low The comfort of the dashboard glow Summer green softly turned black with summer night This room moves smoothly under me And I'm as pleased as I can be So wondering, wondering where I'm meant to be I've been here before Up and down this endless road Measured miles unknown Run away or back to home Escaping through the dark of night Ride on south to catch the light Hoping that the dawn will bring The gift of some repose Happiness and present tense The star in me in present tense Still wondering, wondering where I'm meant to be Nowhere to go Wind place will show me now Nowhere to go Wondering where I'm meant to be.
Thank you. Now, how was it that I came to write the Battle Hymn of the Republic? Well, my husband, Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, the head of the Perkins Institute for the Blind, was appointed one of the members of the Sanitary Commission, and he made many trips to Washington, D.C. to inspect the troops. And in November of 1861, I went with him, along with Governor Andrew and our minister, Reverend James Freeman Clark. As the train left Baltimore, we noticed little clusters of our men huddled about the tracks, and, and my husband said that they were guarding the railroad tracks from attacks by the Confederates who were very nearby in, in Virginia. Oh, we're right here in the heart of the war. Oh, if there was only something I could do to help my, my husband is too old to fight my sons are, are too young, and, and I lack the manual dexterity to prepare the sanitary supplies the soldiers need, all these donkey fingers. If only there was some way that I could serve the Union cause. Well, in Washington, right, right outside our, our window of the hotel, there was a great poster, soldiers' bodies embalmed and shipped to their hometowns right in the heart of the storm. Now, Governor Andrew had arranged for us to have an audience with the president, and as the men talked politics, I, I sat and observed. President Lincoln was seated on the sofa, right beneath Gilbert Stewart's portrait of George Washington. And the contrast between those two faces, Washington's calm eyes looking out from the canvas, and Lincoln's furrowed brow. Well, on, on November 18, Governor Andrew's party was going to go inspect the troops in Virginia. Uh, carriages with uh, gentlemen in top hats and ladies in crinolines galloped across the bridge over the Potomac into Virginia. But our men were surrounded suddenly by, by Confederates and had to be rescued. Well, the coach turned right back to Washington at a gallop, but we soon had to slow down because the road was clogged with other carriages and retreating soldiers. To beguile the time, the soldiers sang snatches of songs. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. And Reverend Clark leaned over and said to me, you know, they are looking for good songs to inspire our men. Why don't you write some fine words to that stirring tune? I have often wished to, I replied. That night, as I slept in our hotel room, I did not hear the soldiers marching in the streets outside. But in the light of early dawn, I awakened. And there, from somewhere, words came to me. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Line after line, like the cadence of marching feet, images from the Old Testament mingled with the things that I had just seen in the past few days. Those campfires about the railroad tracks. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. And, and the flag, the Confederate flag with the coiled snake, let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his keel. Line after line, verse after verse, until it was all done. I got up in the dark and I found a stump of a pencil and some paper and I wrote down the words. I went back to sleep and awakened several hours earlier, later. I remembered what happened, but I couldn't remember the words, but there they were on the paper. And I thought, I like this better than anything I have ever written. I sent it to the Atlantic Monthly, and the editor gave it the title, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. At last. I had found a way to serve the Union cause.
this call March 17th. On March 17th, after dawn, my Aunt Rose called up bartender Sean. We liked it last Pat's day. Can we book it again this day? Hmm, if you liked it, why'd you wait, replied Sean. <laughs> and now I have two short pieces on uh, that include birds of prey that are in flight. The first one is a red-tailed hawk. It's called Meadow Walk. I stride out of pines into sunlight. The stutter of the red tail, a sickle raking the sky, sets under grass whiskers drumming. I cut theriferous milkweed, part rasp-edged brush, Sense ear-taunting rustlings and swallow raspberries tart on the tongue. Give me a year to haunt this clay, to brood, to question, to pour seed pearls into hourglass cases that measure the movement of worms, worms that haunt the cave curtains of groundhogs who lumber through comb-like meadows with stones near brooks bearing fish to the sea. And now for one about an osprey. An osprey is an eagle that eats fish. And I saw this at a pond in Florida. It's called Fish Eagle. Sprawled on a rock, I watch the tree-walled pond, its commerce drenched in heaven's mirror. An osprey mows the air back and forth across the still pool, head down, watching the dark water over and over. She traces a grid as regular as a chessboard, over and over patient, as a grand master, then a hover, a check. Fierce flight forward, driving a slant, she charges the surface like a skipping stone, angling up with a tail-jerking fish in her talons. She climbs the air currents, levels off, and lands to work over her prey on the dead limb of a live oak. Thank you. So 
Strong. 